We come now to our scripture today, which is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 11 to 22. If you have a Bible, I I, uh, do encourage you to grab it and and follow along. Um, As you're looking for that passage, let's pray. We thank you for this chance to be in your word. We thank you mightily, Lord, for your grace in this moment being shown to us, that you direct our path our thoughts, our our hearts into your loving arms. Open up our hearts and our ears to receive this gracious, generous gift from you of your word. We pray, Lord, for the expounding upon the word that it too may be used for your glory and yours alone. We praise you this day in our listening. Challenge us and encourage us as you see fit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 22. Hear now God's word. So then remember. Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He is our peace. In His flesh, He has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God. Built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in in the, the Lord. In him, you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the most, I don't know, maybe I'm overstating it, maybe I'm not. One of the most powerful influences in this world, I think, um, this is just opinion, um, is, is this idea of identity. Each of us have, have different identities. None of us have just one identity. We all identify into different groups. Um, I identify as a father. I identify as a husband. I identify as a pastor. Um, I identify as a friend. I identify, quite proudly, I might add as a nerd um, due to my love for Star Wars and board games and video games. Um, very much a nerd and a geek, I identify with, with that, that group uh, quite strongly, in, in fact. We all have different identities. And identif- identities are powerful influencers in, in our, our, our lives. We identify as into a certain group because when we get into that group, we have commonalities that we can then share with one another. Me, who identify as a father, if I am with another father, we have things that we can relate to. We can talk about those things. Those things can draw us closer to one another, and and we have a place of common ground that we can then build a relationship upon. And identifying with a group of people can be extremely influential and powerful in, in a group. Take, for example... Um, my great city that I do dearly love and identify strongly with, um, Pittsburgh. I love Pittsburgh. I, I, uh, 
even when we live in, um, in, in uh, Punxsutawney area. If I were asked, where do you live? I'd say I live in Pittsburgh, because for me, that's how far the uh, bound, bound, bound boundaries go. All the way from uh, Wheeling, West Virginia, to Johnstown, all the way from Erie to uh, uh, West Virginia in the south. That's Pittsburgh for me. Now, for many others, it's not true. Uh, but I love Pittsburgh. When I went to school at West, West, West Virginia Wesleyan College, um, I talked to someone for five minutes about who knows what, and they said, you're from Pittsburgh, aren't you? And proudly, I say yes. It was probably my uh, extravagant use of the word yins. Over, uh, I overuse it. Um, many people will tell, t- tell you that. Pittsburgh was a city that was uh, made up of many, many different groups of people. Uh, The steel mills, the workers, they drew many different people into Pittsburgh, and it was a melting pot in and of itself um, for many, many years. When you went to work, you worked with people of different nations, different ethnic backgrounds, different economic backgrounds. Um, The great melting pot in some, some ways. Now, all that is great, but because of its diversity, Pittsburgh's diversity, there were other things that sprung up all over the city. Many of you are familiar with some of these things, and I might need some help in identifying some of them. You had the Polish clubs, the Slovak clubs, the Hungarian clubs, the Serbian clubs, the Irish clubs. What else? Am I missing any? What? Ukrainian clubs. Anything else? There Croatians uh, were in there. Something else? Any other clubs I'm missing? Did I, did I miss the Italians? I'm sorry about that. The, I am Italian. I don't know why I missed that. Uh, the Italian clubs. Um, any other clubs? Greece? Greek? The Greek clubs. Uh, you also got your, your veteran societies. You got your, um, your masons. You got um, the Lions, American Legion. What else? The what? Moose. Elks. Why isn't there deer? You got all these different clubs. And what is the purpose of these clubs? You live your, your professional life in the work area. And in the work area, you're surrounded by all kinds of different people. But in these clubs, you can be around people who are like you, who have your your own similarities. You you have common ground in order to build relationships. When the the great melting pot, everyone came to Pittsburgh, they all came together in different ways, but in their spare time, they broke off into similar places. Whole neighborhoods in Pittsburgh are built around uh, uh, national and, and ethnic similarities. We all know some, some of those er- areas. That's the so-and-so area. That's the such-and-such area. People enjoy being around people who are like that. And, and there's nothing inherently wrong about that, necessarily, but the problem does come in is when we start putting value upon our own group up and against another group and devalue that group. I'm Irish, so the Italians, whoa, should never trust an Italian, or whatever the case is. Here, here's one. Hypothetically, that also was a hyp- hypothetical. Hypothetically, um, let's hypothetically say that I am a, here's another group for you, Republican. Right? Those Democrats, oh my goodness. I mean, the, our United States would be so much better if the Democrats weren't here. If they would just zip it and let us Republicans talk, we could have this nation fixed in a second. Now, that is neither true, nor is it correct. Nor is that private knowledge. I mean... We share those things with our closest friends and our our confidants, those whom we trust. But people have been talking like that in the public sphere. 
Uh, social media is a petri dish of uh, disease and bacteria spreading all these kinds of, of, of thoughts. But now not only is it isolated to just social media, but our, our leaders whom we respect and trust are coming out with this sort of thoughts, devaluing another group of people because we identify one way and they disagree with us. The world has had so much um, pain and heartache because of this kind of identity. My identity is better than yours. My values are better than yours. I am right and you need to go away. But this is not a new issue. Paul had to deal with this in his church. In the church that that he helped to found here in Ephesus, there were two groups of people that were fighting against each other, and Paul has had issues with these two groups of people for years throughout his ministry. Huge issues. The Gentiles and the Jewish people. The Jewish people who saw themselves as the in crowd, the ones who had it right, the ones who had all the answers in terms of Christianity. Christianity was born out of Judaism. So many Jews, not all Jews, many Jews, several Jews, we'll say, uh, felt that they held the key, in, in, uh, the key to get into the, the Christian way of, of living. And that key was through the law, through circumcision. In order to be a proper Christian... You had to be circumcised. Our group is the right group. Your group is the wrong group. And if you want to be able to identify with us, you must first be like us. And that's the way that we'll value you. Gentile people identified with all different things. Their own culture, their own religions, where they come from, Greek, Roman, Ephesus, uh, uh, Colossae, Corinth. And all the different religions and beliefs that that they they came. And they were very much pushed into the outside group. And Paul is looking at all this and trying to reconcile all these different identities. And I want you to notice that one of the things that Paul does not do is he does not put down any individual identity. But what he does do is he lifts up an ultimate identity. And that identity is through Jesus Christ. And Paul looks at, at Jesus Christ and says, what Jesus does for us is gives us another identity, a greater identity, that we are loved and cherished and makes a home for all of us. And that home is in the cross. You can be Jewish, you can be Gentile. That doesn't change. You can be rich, you can be poor. That doesn't change. You can be, uh, here's, here's, a, here's an identity that's important to this church. You can be a, um, uh, a Tom Brady fan or you can be a Steeler fan. I can't say New England anymore because wherever Tom Brady is, the Valors will always be. doesn't matter. None of those things make you as a person, val- your value any less. Because the greatest value in our lives is that 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 God has given us in our creation and through the death of Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying that is your identity. That we are the family. The family that is headed up by Christ. Now, I identify strongly with family. I don't know about you, but my idea of family is much smaller than it should be. If you want to be in my family, you better be born into my family. Now, my wife is not born into my family. Um, She is a beautiful exception. Given to me by Christ. She's my family. My kids are my family. And I have trouble seeing beyond that. I have trouble letting anyone else in. 
God has worked on me over the years. And the greatest example that I have is Stephanie and I were talking this morning about this sermon, is that when we look at Jesus and how Jesus has viewed family in his own life, he was preaching and teaching, his family came up to him, and the people said, your, your mother and your brothers are at the gate and they need to talk to you. And Jesus said, who are my mothers and brothers but you? Jesus' idea of his family was much bigger. And not contingent on any particular way of asking. Not contingent on being in any specific identity or social group. Not contingent on, um, on living right or living wrong. When Jesus' world was broken into, Jesus then invited them in. Jesus had friends among zealots, among prostitutes, among tax collectors, among those whom other people would write off. Jesus' family is what we're trying to be. It doesn't mean we ignore the identity and the social groups where people come. That is who people are. We embrace them for being creation of, 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 of God's. We embrace them with love because Christ loved us first for who we are. I was told once that the church is the only social group that is designed not for, primarily not for its members, but for its non-members. It's a challenging saying. I thank God that Jesus' understanding of family wasn't so limited to just one social group that Christ looked at all people and said merely, I love you, and I want you. And I pray that we too, as we look at the social groups, don't place value on a person based on where they come from, but only place value on a person based on does Jesus love them or not? And the answer is yes, Christ does. And I thank God for that challenge in, in, in my own life and for that challenge here in this church. i leave you with this benediction from Jude 24 to 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present, your, and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. And amen. Go in peace.